What is happening, everybody? Time for another installment of Joseph Remembers, where I pick certain things in wrestling that happened, like to the day or to the week or whatever. Very similar to Solo Monsters, uh, This Week in Wrestling History on his podcast. I don't know if he stole that from me or if I stole that from him. Who knows? Uh, we probably both stole it from good mic work because he started doing that like five, six, seven years ago. <laughs> so whatever. But I put a twist on it in that I just kind of, uh, I just kind of watch certain shows and I do take note of them, but I also put like a little personal spin on it, like what was going on in my life during these times and stuff like that. Uh, again, that's what GMW does. Uh, Solo Monster doesn't do that. He goes into detail about like backstage stuff. I don't really have the time to do that. I mean, I want to because I mean, I watch a lot of wrestling uh, related stuff uh, that goes into like the history and stuff, like wrestling bios. And I'm like, oh my god, I could totally do that, you know, like wrestling historian, you know what I mean? But yeah, I, yeah, I don't have the audience to care to do that, you know what I mean, like, I, I'd be doing work for free, like, and I don't have, I have 24 hours in a day, not 48, you know what I mean, not, I don't have 96 hours in a day to do all this stuff, although that'd be really cool, but anyways, um, yeah, so, also, uh, this is gonna be the final wrestling related video on this channel, I'm going to be doing, I'm good, what I'm gonna do in March is I'm going to open, I'm gonna make, uh, different channels, for different uh, topics, okay. <sighs> Excuse me. I'm gonna do a. Uh, I'm gonna do a gaming. This Sir Joseph is gonna be the gaming channel. That's where I'm gonna do all my gaming related stuff and nothing but gaming, by the way. I might uh, talk about my other channels and just be like, "Yo, this new ch this channel is gonna have this kind of content coming soon." If you want to watch that, that kind of stuff. But I'm gonna have a wrestling one. Uh, it's and. The, the new, my new wrestling related channel that I'm going to be coming out with and launching in uh, March is going to be related to a certain AEW performer uh, that I'm not going to mention quite yet. Uh, but the very first video on that is going to be a fantasy booking where there's this certain performer who is better than you and you know it will win the AEW World Championship. It's going to be, I'm going to film it, the fantasy booking video, on his birthday, which is in a month from now, okay? If, if you know that quote, you know who I'm talking about, okay? So, yeah. <laughs> I'm also, obviously, because we're coming up on it, uh, 20 years since WCW had its final show. Duh, of course I'm going to do that, but it's not going to be on this channel, it's going to be on the other channel. On my other wrestling channel. That's going to be the first Joseph. That's going to be the first Remembers video on it. Okay. Other than the uh, uh, the trailer and stuff like that. So let me check my phone real quick here. It's, uh, all right. Yeah. Anyways. What, sorry. It's a girlfriend in progress. Um. Yeah. That's why I keep it on silent. Because people text me like crazy all the time. And I'm not. Whatever. So. That's also why I'm not doing face cam for this, just because it's like, why? Like, I'm just, it's just a podcast, you know what I mean? Uh, so yeah, so fine, this is the final piece of wrestling content you will see on this channel. I have a lot of ideas for fantasy booking that I am going to do, but that's going to be on the other, on the new wrestling channel coming out in two weeks' time. Anyways, so, as you can see three separate events here, uh, and Solo Monster did talk about, I think, all three. No, 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 uh, all of them except the one with, uh, Eddie Guerrero winning the WWE title in No Way Out 04. So, in chronological, uh, order, 25 years ago, Brian Pillman made a surprise appearance at CyberSlam 1996. This was after he, uh, decided to take a break from WCW, he thought that his Flying Brian uh, character was getting pretty stale. And it kind of was. I mean, he did his little spoofs of, of Flair for the Gold <laughs> with uh, Steve Austin, which is pretty awesome. But they had him and Austin break up, and then after that happened, 
Pillman was kind of like, eh, I don't know what to do now. <laughs> so things suck. And it was either him who got pitched the who pitched the idea to Eric Bischoff or Eric Bischoff who pitched the idea to him. I don't remember. Bischoff talks about it at, in great detail in his 83 Weeks podcast. I think it was like the third ever 83 Weeks, too. It was one of like the first like 10 where he talks about Brian Pillman wanting to do a thing called the loose cannon where he just kind of, where he, where he, you know, uh, talks about behind the scenes stuff, you know what I mean? And so a few days uh, before Cyber Slam 1996, uh, he had a match against uh, Kevin Sullivan where the loser, it was like an I quit match where the, where the loser had to say I respect you. And that was like the that's like the version of I quit. And like as soon as the match started, Brian Pillman just like goes in the microphone. And he says, "I respect you, Booker Man," because Kevin Sullivan was doing a little bit of most of the booking in WCW going into 1996, and then he just walks off. <laughs> and uh, in the Brian Pillman DVD that WWE came out uh, with in 2007 or something like that Bischoff says oh you know I want him to just uh, you know go to ECW and kind of work on this loose cannon character since that character would be a, would fit uh, ECW like a glove and then come back here after a year something like that 1997 uh, and so yeah and so Pillman comes in at Cyberslam 1986, and he does his now almost infamous Smart Marks promo, which is probably Paul Heyman's idea. Actually, it's probably Foley's. It was probably McFoley's idea to do that promo because it does sound like something that Foley at that time would say too. And I'll go into that when I uh, when I summarize uh, the event. He goes. He, you know, he says, oh, I've been fired by WCW, and Eric Bischoff is whatever, you know, he's he's a piece of shit, and the, the crowd is chanting, Bischoff takes it up the ass, do-da, do-da, <laughs> you go, <laughs> oh my god, so the fans were behind him like crazy, and apparently it was Heyman's idea to have Pillman uh, turn on the fans, because I guess he knew that it wasn't going to last, you know what I mean? to be the loose cannon thing, you know what I mean? And so he goes, in his promo, he says, oh, you know, Eric Bischoff is all these fans in the arena who call themselves smart marks. And he's like, what's a smart mark? A mark with a high Q? He's like, you know what a mark is? A mark is someone who spends their last $20 on, on crack cocaine. <laughs> and he goes, and his inflection and his delivery is, is perfect in this promo and you know what as, as, cussing aside because he does cuss a lot which it's there are like probably about 25 or so cuss words that were uttered uh, among all the matches and segments in uh, Cyber Slave 1996 so ECW was like yeah just cusses just be a sailor it's okay cussing aside this is a great promo for anyone to learn from when it comes to speaking overall speaking skills in any given wrestling product. Um, even today, WWE, with as limited as the writers probably are, and I am going to talk about that on the new wrestling channel that I'm going to do. I'm going to make a big podcast about that, about how, about how you shouldn't expect any good quality shows from WWE from this point forward because they don't need to be. They don't have to have good quality. They don't need fans. They proved that for an entire 365 days almost now that they don't need fans, they don't need they don't need asses and seats or eyeballs on a show, yeah. But I'm not getting sidetracked here because like Pillman's promo, this his Smart Marks promo is just amazing. It's just really that good, and it like locks you in. And I think there is. A really young Don Callis, who is a plant fan right next to Sign Guy and Hack Guy, 
who always had the same seats because they almost they were, they were they were almost part of the show at this point. Like sign guy would have a different sign. His sign guy's sign uh, during Pillman's segment said read, "Don't work us, Pill uh, Brian Pillman. Don't work us." And they then they chanted, "Read the sign, read the sign at him." And that's when Pillman goes, "Oh, okay." You know what a mark is, you know, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. And I think, like, as a dude who looks almost like Don Callis, has, like, the same kind of physique, different hair, like, gets into it with Pillman as uh, Shane Douglas and Todd Gordon and Paul Heyman all come out. And Todd Gordon's like, oh, this wasn't part of the deal. And Heyman's like, Yo, this was not part of the deal. What are you doing? And Pillman's like, deal? It's no deal. I do what I want, whatever I want, Booker man. And then he goes, oh, I'm going to go ahead and, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and, I'm going to pull down my pants and pee on the ring, <laughs> which he doesn't do, obviously. <laughs> and then after the segment, uh, Shane Douglas goes, either kick this guy out, either kick his, either kick his ass out or I'm going to kick his, or I'm going to kick his ass out. <laughs> and, and, and. And Shane Douglas just cusses like a sailor in the promo too. And this was when Douglas, this was when Shane Douglas, uh, I think it was like a few weeks or a few months after he left the uh, WWE, uh, after Dean Douglas, after he was Dean Douglas. So yeah. So that's kind of a, the main thing about that show. But let me talk about how things were 25 years ago for me. So I was in junior high in, uh, 1996, in February 96, um, it's smack in the middle of my junior high career, you know, it was in seventh grade and the second semester, <laughs> and actually, uh, this was a few days after I received my first, uh, pet cat, it was a cat from the, Hem it was two cats from the Hemingway house, one of them was, one of them had, like, gray and white, and one of them was black and white, they were almost like Dalmatian looking cats, really weird, and because they're from the Hemingway House, which is located in, I think, Key West, and it was known for having a, for producing litters of cats who had more than four toes. And so one of them, who my mom named Hemingway, I, I don't, my mom is not creative, okay? Like, I was going to name him after Mortal Kombat characters. And I did do that with the, fir the, the, with the gray and white one. I named him Smoke. You know, like Smoke, the Mortal Kombat 3 uh, character. And uh, the black and white one that mom named uh, Hemingway, I was going to name him Alphador after uh, Magus's cat in Chrono Trigger because I like playing that game. I loved it in 1996. It was all I played that year. <laughs> it was that. It was Secret of Evermore, and it was Earthbound. That was like the trifecta. You know what I mean? But I didn't want to name it after an Earthbound character, so I'm like, ah, oh, let me name it after Magus's cat. You know? But... Uh, but, but, but Hemingway, the black and white cat, had nine toes on his front paw. His front right paw had nine toes. Nine. It was crazy. They were like little baseball mitts, and it was ridiculous. And you couldn't declaw it because you'd have to remove the claws. So we had to cut his claws. And so I didn't do that, but I replaced their litter and stuff like that. And I got, I got lazy doing that. So, like, my mom's like, all right, well, you know, I'm just going to take him then. And then my mom got, my mom left my dad and stuff and took the animals with her because I wasn't being responsible. That was like a year after that. So, and yeah, junior high was crazy for me. Uh, <laughs> I'm, la I'm, I'm actually quite happy that I can laugh about her now because 25 years ago, I wasn't really laughing that hard. Uh, I got bullied like crazy. Uh, and like, but I bullied other kids, too. It was so weird. It was, like, so middle of the road. And, like, so, like... And, like, certain bullies, I would bully them, and they'd bully me back, and I'd bully... They'd bully me, and I'd bully them back. And, like... But there was this one girl who... If, any, if anyone listening to that... Lis, listening to this... Is a Green Day fan. You'll know that Green Day... Uh, that Billy Joe in that band... He wrote a song called uh, Pulling Teeth, which is about a girl who used to beat him up. And then, like, fool around with him. Uh, I had the same experience in junior high. <laughs> Only this girl didn't fool around with me after she beat me up. But she would just beat me up constantly. And I couldn't do anything because she was a girl. Like, I can't hit back. It's a girl. I'll get in even worse trouble than she would get for hitting me. 
So, you know, I had to deal with that all that school year. It was crazy. Uh, but I still had decent, you know, friends. I still had some decent buddies. You know, I still had a fun time. You know, it's carefree stuff. You know what I mean? I didn't really care. You know, my dad would get all crazy about my grades and stuff. And I'd be like, none of this counts until high school, dude. Like, I had it figured out. And, like, and because I wasn't doing the chores to, to, uh, change my cat's litter and stuff like that. My mom took my allowance away. And my dad was still traveling. He was still like a traveling, uh, he was like a traveling salesman of sorts before he settled into his, uh, job at Westinghouse. He acquired a job at Westinghouse shortly after my mom left us. Uh, but before then, he was just like, he was going to and from, uh, Florida and, uh, Massachusetts, uh, like working, I think doing like tech support or something for, for, uh, for certain businesses. I don't know. I think there was one time where he owned a flower shop with one of his buddies or something like that. I don't know, but my, it was just me and my mom for a while. And so my mom would take away my allowance away. So I didn't have allowance, but I still wanted to buy stuff. still wanted to buy video games. I still wanted to rent them and stuff like that. So, and I had a really early lunch period at like 11 o'clock. My school day started at 9, so I'd eat breakfast at like 8, 8.30, go to school, and I wouldn't be hungry at all. I'd be like, I don't need to eat anymore. It's 11 o'clock. I just ate three hours ago. So I would keep like a snack. Like my, my mom packed like a bag of chips, a soda, uh, a piece of fruit, whether it was an apple or an orange or a pear or a pineapple or a banana, something like that, a soda and a sandwich. And like... And so, like, my mom would, like, like pack the sandwiches, like, really good. They were, like, really tasty sandwiches. And so I was like, well, I don't really want this sandwich. So let me try and sell it. And so what would happen is that I, at my lunch table, and this is how I made friends in junior high, by auctioning off some of my school lunch. I would, uh... I would take the sandwich out of the bag, I would take the chips out of the bag, or the, the, uh, I would take the sandwich out of the bag, and I would take the chips out of the bag, and I would sell them, and at one point, I would sell one of my sandwiches, I would sell a sandwich for like four dollars, and this was every day, there were some weeks after, in, in seventh grade, and in, in, in some of eighth grade, in junior high, where I would make like probably like forty dollars or not forty but like twenty something dollars and so I would use that money to buy video games and I would also use that money to uh, to buy to to, uh, to like almost replenish like stock because <laughs> there was like a Win Dixie right next to me like a block away where I could walk to and my mom didn't get off work until like six seven in the evening so I'd be home alone for a little bit and so I would take the money that I made and I would buy more cold cuts. I'd buy like whatever the kids liked, whatever, whatever, whatever produced like the highest sale, <laughs> whether it was turkey or ham or, or like whatever cheese that they liked, you know, that kind of stuff. And also bread, of course, I would do that too. And I would, I would just make an excuse to my mom saying, oh, I was just extra hungry. So I just, you know, whatever I, I would take. And there would be some days where I would take two sandwiches. I'd pack one bag and I would leave it in the corner of the fridge and I would wake up early and I would sneak it in my, in my, in my backpack before, like, I was, before getting on the bus. And so I would take, sometimes I would take two sandwiches and I would sell both of those for like three bucks a piece. Yeah, so those were fun times. Like, I remember that more than the bullying in junior high. So that was what was going on in my life in 96, 25 years ago. So, like, I knew I had it in me to to be a, to not really be a salesman, but to be an entrepreneur. I had that entrepreneurial mindset, and I didn't know I really had that. You know, I didn't really embrace it, I guess, as much as I should have, you know? But, yeah, let's go through uh, Cyber Slam 1996. Just some notable stuff that I saw during the show. So, yeah, it's at the ECW Arena, the new... Alhambra, whatever center. I don't know. They keep calling it a different name every time. I mean, it. it I mean, back then in '96, it was called the ECW Arena. You know what I mean? But now it's like something different. It's always gonna be something different. Whatever. 
at the bingo hall, the bingo hall on Swanson and, Whit and Rittner. And that's where ECW in 1996, before they really, before they really got national exposure, that's where they ran about 85% of their shows, or like two thirds of them. Now, one thing about ECW 96 is that they were being syndicated on different channels, and they were also extremely popular where I was living in South Florida. And that's how I discovered ECW was by staying up very late at night and I would watch Beavis and Butthead and other stuff like that and I would switch to some sports channels watch some sports center stuff like that and uh, there was a channel called uh, just sports channel Florida I think it was uh, and then it started and then it uh, going into the 2000s it was called Sunshine Network it became Sunshine Network but but before then it was sports channel Florida I even remember the channel it was 38 and uh it's like two in the morning and I'm watching and, and they put on wrestling and I'm like what this isn't WCW this isn't WWE this is this looks local and they would do reruns of shows that they filmed in Fort Lauderdale in Davie which is uh, like a country sub area of Fort Lauderdale like in Hollywood Florida which is also it's like a, another like ghetto area in Fort Lauderdale and stuff like that. And uh, they didn't touch Miami, but they would go to places that I recognized, like Sunrise. I'd be like, oh my god, Sunrise, that's where I bowled like when I was a little kid. There was one place I remember that they, I remember the actual arena. Because I think I went to see like... I think I went to see like a like a like a play like right next to it. I remember, and I was like, "Oh my god!" So yeah, so that's how I discovered ECW, and it's around this time, 1996. I had personally discovered it after uh, CyberSlam '96. I discovered it like in the summer of '96, like right smack in the middle of the uh, Sandman and Raven feud, which they do have a match during this show, by the way. So yeah, we'll talk about that. But yeah, let's run down the show. So. So way back in 96, the Dudleys were like, they, they, they were like pro for like two years, <laughs> both of them, both Mark LaMonaco, who is Bubba, and uh, Devon Hughes, which is Devon. Devon Hughes, Devon Dudley here, went by Roughneck Mr. Hughes, and he was just some super serious, like, muscled out, like, you know, boring monster heel and he has a match against Bubba Ray and the Dudleys, who were good guys, I guess, here. And all the Dudleys come out, you know, dances with Dudley and Big Dick Dudley and stuff like that. And they have a really weird match. <laughs> and Bubba Ray, like, he, like, he would hit a move on, Dove, on Devon, and then he would dance. So, yeah, like, that was, like, most of the match. It was really weird. <laughs> okay. And so, the next match after that, I think it was just, and I'm missing a lot of stuff here because a lot of this stuff is forgettable, but the stuff that's memorable I'm going to go over, so I'm not going over the entire show. <laughs> but they had a thing, they had a match with uh, Taz versus uh, some some jobber dude, and that ends, and Taz beats the shit out of him, and then, and then some other guys go to help the other guy who Taz just beat. And he suplexes all of them. And I'm sitting there thinking, Taz in 1986 walked so that Suplex City Brock Lesnar could run. Okay? Like, if you watch what happens there, and if you have the network, Cyberslam 1996, you actually have to physically search for it. Uh, it's not really listed, which is weird in WWE Network. So just, so just look it up and just search it out. And you'll see that Taz just suplexed the shit out of everybody. And then like, and then Mikey Whipwreck comes out. And apparently this was when Mikey Whipwreck, Whipwreck started doing offensive maneuvers. Cause he had, there was a time, I think his first whole year in ECW, he didn't do a single offensive maneuver at all. <laughs> but I guess that all ended in 95, 96. So he, 
him and Taz like brawl it out, and, but Taz suplexes him and puts him in the Taz mission and stuff like that. So, yeah, Taz 25 years ago walked so that Suplex City Brock Lesnar could run for sure. Yeah. And, and Sabu and Scorpio, uh, Too Cold Scorpio, had a really good technical match for the TV title that lasted 30 minutes. And I think the stipulation here was that if it goes to the entire 30 minutes, then Scorpio, then Too Cold Scorpio keeps the title. But if Sabu can beat him in the 30 minutes and Sabu gets the title, something like that, I don't know. Uh, and it's a really weird match because most Sabu matches have him just flying through tables and doing all that good stuff, you know, all the really high, all the high risk and uh, super athletic flippy stuff. And you don't really see, you see a little bit of that here with Sabu versus Two Cold Scorpio, but you don't really see it a lot. And it's just a really cool, fun match. Really good technical match. There are a lot of technical matches in Cyber Slam 1996. It wasn't like most other episodes of like hardcore TV where it was just like, let's have brawls everywhere. There was a lot of overbooking because that's how Paul Heyman books everything. It's just to overbook the shit out of everything, no matter what. But here you see that here too, but you don't see it too much, you know, so it's good. It's a fun match. And then we have Mick Foley versus uh, Shane Douglas. <laughs> this was months before Foley would go to WWE and become Mankind. And in like most of 95 and up until, uh, up until Foley left, Foley had a legitimate beef with ECW fans who and he says this in the ECW DVD he says he think he's like yo these fans just want way too much from these performers like dude we're human man like come on you know and the whole Kane Dewey promo and other stuff like that and he and apparently fully like wanted to like really piss off fans and this was, I think this is all his idea too. So he had a shirt again, so in his match against Shane Douglas, he has a shirt, a, t a white t-shirt that has like a caricature drawing of Eric Bischoff on the front of it with the back of it saying, I'm sorry, Uncle Eric. <laughs> this is great. Oh my god. And so they have a really crazy match. <laughs> I think I think I think um Shane Douglas wins. I don't really remember. Uh, sorry, just some water there. Uh, but yeah. So yeah, let's see. What other stuff like that? Um let's see. And uh during like during some of the breaks or whatever when they're, you know, Cause this is like taped. It's different, like different different times. You can see it in the editing. The editing of this was like really like not good because like it's ECW and the early in the mid nineties. <laughs> so you could tell this was shot on different days, and it was all kind of pieced together. And Styles, like I think this actually was attempted to be broadcast online because Joy Styles says, "Oh, you know." There's there's hundreds of people in the area joining us tonight, you know what I mean, for this internet convention. And this is a, a, a whole year and some change before ECW's first pay-per-view, Barely Legal 97. So, could this be the very first uh, webcast of a wrestling event? I don't really know. But anyways... So, final match here is is Sandman versus Raven for the. Oh wait, no, that's right. Raven has a uh, before this match. Uh, Raven has a segment with uh, Dreamer, Tommy Dreamer, because it was still the Tommy Dreamer and Sandman feud that lasted all the way until Raven left for WCW '97, uh, for all the way from '97 five to '97, and they kept adding like. Kept adding people in it, which was pretty cool. 
Like, you don't really see that nowadays. You see that nowadays, but it's, like, kind of forced. And this was not forced. Like, everything made sense here. You know what I mean? Uh, and so, Dreamer is injured. And he's like, oh, you know, I'm going to be back soon, whatever. And then Raven goes, Raven goes, do you think breaking your arm is, like, the punishment that you get for, you know, sleeping with my girl? Because, like, Dreamer, I think, stole, like, Buell McGillicuddy from uh, Raven or something like that. And so, like, Raven goes, like, oh, you know, in, in, he lists out a whole bunch of countries. They, they chop your arm off if you steal something, that kind of stuff, you know what I mean? And Raven goes, for doing what you did, I'm gonna kill you, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's crazy. And this is also where you see, uh, Kimono Wanalea. Well, I think, yeah, so, and this, and I think what, ha and what happens, like, a month or so after this at Hostile City Showdown. 96 is that yeah her and Buell McGillicuddy hook up and stuff like that and, and Shane Douglas says oh Buell McGillicuddy was never pregnant she wasn't pregnant at all and Buell McGillicuddy goes like goes like yeah I'm cheating on Tommy Dreamer with Kimono Wanalea <laughs> so it was first ever HLA thing in wrestling did it age well? No. Did anything in ECW age well? Probably not. I mean, after seeing the after seeing the Benoit documentary, I'm like, oh my god, all these unprotected chair shots, bro. Like, I, I don't want to see that. <laughs> Another thing I forgot. Uh, there was supposed to be a gangsters match. Mustafa comes out, and he's like, oh yeah, New Jack's in jail. And then... Some other guy from a tag team called the Headhunters or whatever says, "Oh, I can be, I can sub for you for New Jack for you if you want." And Mustafa's like, "No," and so they all beat up on Mustafa. <laughs> and then I think like uh, Axel Rotten comes in to save Mustafa, and those two have a match against the Headhunters. I don't remember. Um, yeah. And you have the Eliminators versus the Bulldogs. I forgot about that. And they put on a really hard-hitting match where Francine gets hit with the uh, total elimination. And this was after Perry Saturn was uh, was forced to cut his hair. So it was like the first match where Perry Saturn has short hair. So, yeah. So And yet with Francine getting hit by... A t by with a chick being hit by two, you know dudes with their tag team uh technique would that get would that fly today uh no did it age well i don't know kind of i mean no way like, eh. but then again francine was like you know like 110 pounds and you got dudes twice her size hitting her with total elimination it's like no nah, bro I, I, I ain't doing that <laughs> Uh, she was like a hundred pounds heavier, sure, I guess, but I don't know. So then you have Raven versus Sandman for the ECW title. Something I didn't recognize was that Missy Hyatt was in the ECW in 1996. And they call her like the, the, the riot Missy Hyatt. She looks busted in this show. <laughs> like beyond busted. Like, oh my god. So, yeah. It's crazy. And, like, so, like... And I think Ra Raven retains... Uh, and Blue Meanie is, like... And so, yeah, so Raven has his little crew. He has Blue Meanie, he has Stevie Richards, and stuff like that. And I think at the end of the match... Blue Meanie is, like, beating up on the Sandman, and, like, he, like, pours beer on the Sandman, and then it, like, wakes the Sandman up, <laughs> and then the Sandman beats the crap out of the Blue Meanie, and that's how the show ends, so, yeah, crazy show, okay, alright, second one, so, Eddie Guerrero winning the WWE title at No Way Out 2004, this was, to me, Unexpected. This was when I actually had a little bit more education about wrestling as an industry. Um, 
I didn't in the early in the mid '90s. I kind of did. I, I knew it was staged. I knew some of the full, right, of the uh, of the real names of some of the performers. Um, like, I knew that Raven was Scott Levy. You know, I knew because I because I, I caught him like. Actually, I thought Raven was Johnny Polo. I thought his actual name was John Polo. But then I'm like. Oh wait! Oh, that's right. He was a uh, Scotty the Body Flamingo. So maybe he's, you know. That's, so I kind of knew that, you know, but stuff like that. But like, in two thousand four, I knew about like what goes on. You know what I mean? Like, and I knew that a guy like Eddie Guerrero would never win the WWE title. Like, I'm like, you know, and I was uh in wrestling communities on game FAQs back then and like we had like a little no way out discussion and I said Brock Lesnar is gonna like I mean Brock Lesnar is gonna give Guerrero a good 20 or so minutes probably or a good 15 or so minutes but Lesnar is going over clean and he didn't and I was like oh my lord they just let a 30 seven-year-old Eddie Guerrero win the WWE title off of a 25-year-old Brock Lesnar. And then it was revealed that Lesnar was about to quit or that his contract was up and he didn't, he was going to try out for football. And then I'm like, oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. And then I'm, then I said to myself, oh, you know what? This is going to be a transitional reign. Uh, Kurt Angle's probably going to win the title again. He's probably going to hold it for the next dude who comes around. That kind of stuff. So, yeah. Hang on one second. Uh, let me uh, answer this. So, yeah. So. Let me get rid of this. There we go. Yeah. So, 2004. What was going on in my life? Well. In 2004, I was still in college. It was my third year of college. Right in the middle of my third year of college. I'll f I, I remember it like it was yesterday, man. I was so... My, it was my second semester at U, at U of Florida. University of Florida. This is my second semester away from... Uh, away from my dad. And away from my parents and stuff like that. So my first... So I'd been living just at... A, I'd been living in an on-campus apartment... And although you could order pay-per-views there, I didn't have a job at the time. I was relying on my dad to give me money, and I didn't want him to give me, you know, 50 bucks for the pay-per-view. Uh, and one of the guys I was living with, who was also a wrestling fan, he moved. And me and him, we would like, he would, he was a grad student, so before... 04, before the 2004 semester, in the fall 2003 semester, we would watch pay-per-views. He would order them because he had the money to do it. And I would, like, uh, buy him, like, a beer or something like that. I would, I would buy a six-pack. And he'd be like, yeah, just buy, like, a six-pack of beer and we'll, and all of us will drink it and we'll watch this pay-per-view. Uh, I couldn't do that going into 04. So I had to go on Game FAQ's message boards to, you know, get the get, you know, to enter the thread, so that kind of stuff, uh, I'll be honest, um, I look at the mid-2000s as a series of missed opportunities in a lot of areas of my life, uh, because this was when I had the most momentum, I had, I had a lot of momentum in my love life, because I was around a lot of very attractive women my own age, who, if I wasn't intimidated by them, and if I had better social skills back then, this, if I had the social skills now that I had 18 or 17 years ago, I, you know what? I'm kind of glad I didn't because I probably would have had, I probably would have had like three STDs. <laughs> Especially at a place like U Florida, Florida State, and all these other colleges where you got horny, young college girls who, you know, are just waiting to, you know, do their thing, you know what I mean? 
Nothing against that, as long as you use protection and have as much sex as you want, makes no difference to me. But, you know, when you're 21, when you're 21 and a half, you know, how responsible are you going to be? You know what I mean? Uh, same with my vocation. I had no idea what I wanted to do after college. I, I had zero. I had I had somewhat of an idea. Like, I wanted to work in education, but the more I explored it, the less attracted to it I got. And so I kind of didn't have any real uh, vocational plans. And I wouldn't have any real vocational plans until about 10 or so years after. <laughs> Way back in 2014 is when I really started saying, you know what, I should write for a living. You know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah. And also like, I was I still had a ridiculous crush on this cheerleader that I had that I met in uh, my high school and she happened to go to the same college as me back then in 04 so I was like oh man I could probably you know I could I could I could still meet this girl and I could still you know we could still be together you know that kind of stuff so I was still under the influence of crush I was still sick with feelings for this girl you know what I mean and it's funny because also in uh also around this time, I was on a bowling team with two sorority girls who were clearly more attractive than this other girl who I was pining over. And I, and they were sweet girls. They were really friendly. They were really polite. They were really cool. They were just as good. They were, I was like meh at bowling back then because I just had a plastic spare ball and just threw it straight at everything. I don't do that now. I do a variation of that. <laughs> And I'm trying to get more rotation stuff. I am going to make a bowling uh, YouTube channel in March, too. Definitely going to do that. Uh, but, yeah. So, you know, me and, well, I mean, it was just me and these two sorority girls, you know. And they were two cool girls. But I had no, I think I had no, I they had no idea how to make move on them at all. I just didn't even know how to ask a girl out back then. <laughs> I would just kind of, like, blurt it out. You know, I'd just be like, oh, do you want to, like, go somewhere to do something? You know, so I was, so, you know, all things considered, I was a lost motherfucker in 2004, but I was a lost motherfucker who was still kind of hopeful for the future and still kind of innocent, you know what I mean? And still uh, kind of, still kind of excited about my future, still kind of excited about things, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Anyways, <clears throat> let's go over the show. You can tell that Paul Heyman booked this booked the shit out of the show too because, oh God, I thought Paul Heyman had had to have had like, like, like chick issues back in the day because, oh my God, does he? And I'm not trying to sound like one of these, you know, like, uh, I'm not trying to sound like, I'm not trying to sound like someone who's like, oh, you know, women ought to be treated better. Like, I'm not trying to sound like one of those people, you know what I mean? I'm not trying to sound like one of these, like, women's movement guys, you know what I mean? Uh, who, you know, like, who just like, you know, was like, who like puts them on pedestals and stuff like that. But the way that chicks were treated in SmackDown in 2003-2004, yeah, did not age well, man. It just, for me, it doesn't. And it does have its place. Let's be real, okay? But it needs to be blended in with some quality stuff. You know what I mean? Trish Stratus in 2002, in the entire 2000, in the year, in the entire calendar year of 2002, is a great example. Because you would have her, she would be booked in like a mud wrestling match, or a bikini contest, or a wet t-shirt contest, or a strip tease for, you know, some guys in the audience, you know what I mean? But then, the very next week, she would have a a four star match with Lita, you know what I mean? Or if she would, or her and Victoria would tear the house down and beat the shit out of each other with weapons, you know what I mean? Like, 
So if you have one, you got to have the other. And that's the thing with ladies wrestling today too, is that all we have are the tech, all we have are the cool matches. You know, I lo- I would love to see some of these ladies right now do what they did, do what uh, the ladies uh, 15 some odd years were doing. But that'd be fantastic. Because the women wrestling now, in WWE at least, their physiques are, and their figures are miles better than the plastic Barbie dolls that WWE had in the early to late, and especially late 2000s, especially the 2010s. Okay? That said, Tori and Sable start off the show. And they're like, oh, we're going to do stuff that you can only see in pay-per-view. And I think, I think uh, WWE Network cut this out. But I do remember, I think I do remember, like, they took each other's clothes off and made out or something like that. Because both of them were on the cover of Playboy and stuff like that. So, you know, that kind of stuff. And also, oh, God. So, like, the, 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 the... the lower part of the card was like dedicated to just chicks beat to do to like dudes beating chicks up. It's so bad, man. Like you had Nidia versus Jamie Noble, where Jamie Noble's blindfolded, and Nidia gets some offense in. You know, okay, it's a cool intergender match. I'm not saying that chicks have to go over on intergender matches all the time. Absolutely not. You know what I mean? But it shouldn't be 50-50 either, because 50-50 booking is dumb. You know what I mean? But, like... So they have an idiot hit Noble with some stuff, and then Noble wins a match. <laughs> it's like, well, come on, dude. Like, isn't Noble supposed to be getting up, a comeuppance here at all? And I think he does, like, on one of the episodes of SmackDown after, where, like, Nidia, like, beats him up, like like, crazy or something like that, but I don't know, or, like, someone, or I think, like, Nidia has, like, announces that she has, like, a brother, and I think it's, like, Vito or something like that, who beats up Noble and beats the shit out of him, or or Nunzio beats him up, I don't remember, but, yeah, and then he had APA versus the Bashams, and the Bashams had Shaniqua, who was Linda Miles from Tough Enough Season 3, or 2, I think 2. The one with Jackie Gata. So I think two. I think the second season. Because second season is two chicks one instead of a chicken and a dude. So yeah. And and the APA and, 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 and here's here's Bradshaw giving Shaniqua a close on from hell. Like like really? Like damn. Like I understand that. It's 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 I guess seeing chicks take those kind of bumps it kinda of shows that they are empowered. You know what I mean? But, like, I don't know, man. It just, to me, it don't age well. Maybe it ages well for some. I'm not here to judge anybody. That's just how it is for me. And so during the, like, during early 2004, because Undertaker was taking time off because he lost the uh, Buried Alive match at Sapphire Series 03. So he was doing vignettes for his impending return. And you see that in this show too. Uh, uh, yeah. So that that happens. And I think this was also the APA's final match before uh, before Farouk took time off and before uh, JB and before Bradshaw became John Bradshaw Layfield, I think. I'm not sure. I think they have a few more matches. I know that JBL uh, beats Guerrero for the title at, I think, Judgment Day 04? Or before that? I think it's before Judgment Day 04. Judgment Day 04 is where Eddie Guerrero just bleeds like crazy because he accidentally cut an artery when he bladed. (laughs) But poor guy. (laughs) But yeah. But I think so. So, yeah. And another cool thing about this show is that both Guerreros, both Cha- both Chavo and Eddie, they both win titles. Uh, Chavo wins the Cruiserweight 
and Eddie Guerrero wins the WWE title. So I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, Kurt Angle and Big Show and John Cena have a number one contender match. Who uh, and Angle wins. And Cena was still the uh, doing the thugonomics thing, and it was this was before it became cringe. Uh, it turned like really cringe going into like two thousand six, I'd say, something like that. And yeah, and oh, and the next show that I'm about to uh, talk about, it gets real cringe. <laughs> oh man. But he wasn't cringe here. It had a cool little freestyle about Big Show and Kurt Angle. But Angle beats them both. And yeah, so that's No Way Out 2004. And yeah, this was also Brock Lesnar's final like title match. He wouldn't have another title match for, good gosh, like nine years in WWE. <laughs> and yeah, Goldberg. He had a he had that he had a seat. He had a front row ticket, and uh, he. And he interfered in the match against him and Guerrero, and that's how Eddie Guerrero won the title. So yeah, good stuff. And Eddie Guerrero, he that would be his first, last, and only WWE title reign, because he would you know, he would be taken from us 18 months after this, right around. And that sucks. Uh, I wanted to do a remembers video on that, but I couldn't find anything to add it to. You know, what I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't find any other events that were within that kind of timeline. Uh, but yeah. Okay, now final one here is February fourteenth, two thousand eleven. If anyone wants to tell me, if you could ask me when WWE was at its least watchable, it's early two thousand eleven. It's late two thousand ten to early 2011. This show is worse, as bad, if not worse, than current WWE. Oh my god, oh my god, help me. This show sucked dick. Oh god. The Nickelback theme. Michael Cole trying to be a bad guy on commentary. Josh Matthews on commentary, which is miles better than Byron Saxton on commentary. <laughs> Byron Saxton on commentary, bro, is like it. It's 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 it's. it's I'd rather get COVID again. Then it, it, okay, like if you could tell me what's worse, like having COVID or a solo Byron Saxton, I'd be like, give me COVID again. God damn it. So it's not that bad, but still. And also, 2011, if you could ask me, like, to go through each year of my life, like, from the time I turned, like, eight years old, when I could actually, you know, remember that kind of stuff, when I was, had, like, you know, like, significant memories, and ask me, like, which year of my life was the worst from January to December 31st, it's 2011. Uh, I was doing content on this channel too in 2011, and uh, that was pretty much the only thing I had any energy to do. Uh, I was flunking out of college. I, I went back to college, and but oh, it's only because I wanted to bowl for my college. I didn't want to do anything else except that. So I'm like, all right, well, let me just phone in all my classes and not care. And let me see if I can get on this bowling team, which I did. But I went on, I was on the, uh, the uh, second string one, which only traveled to the local tournaments. And I wanted to go to the ones that were on the national ones. But I couldn't do that. It wasn't good enough. So I was really bummed out about that. Um... I, you know, I just, I'd spent a whole bunch of time and money wasting it on college-related stuff. I had a, I was, th I was like two or so years into my, my like entry-level, my entry-level job at a gas station. 
which I stayed like probably seven years too long. <laughs> uh, my love life was non-existent. Um, and I was staring down, I was down, staring down the barrel of a pretty meaningless existence. Um, and things were coming to a head for me personally in 2011. Um, it, and I'm pretty sure I still have content uh, in 2011 on this very channel. I was calling myself a different name. I was calling myself the Big Jew, but not anymore. Um, but yeah. Uh, and it's and I think I was pushing thirty back then, and I have more vitality and energy now pushing forty than I did ten years ago pushing thirty. So I don't know how that works. I'll tell you how that works. That works because I have better habits. And I have uh, a better focus in my life and other stuff like that. Uh, and a bigger sense of contribution than I had back then. Back then, I wanted to just be like the next Spoonie, wanted to be like the next H.C. Uh, Bailey when it came to playthroughs. I, I remember watching DSP a lot back then too, and I'm like, oh man, you know, if he can do it, anyone can do it, which is kind of true, but, <laughs> but, you know, to what degree do you have to do this, you know what I mean? I didn't know that part, you know? <laughs> and same with like, the same with other wrestling uh, uh, content creators who were really popular back then, like OTRS and what and Wrestling Jesus. I don't know if you remember that dude, you know that kind of stuff. So I was like, man, I could do this too. I just gotta, you know, I just got, I just gotta make content, you know. And like I, but I had no idea what I was doing then. I don't know what I'm doing now. I just fire up OBS and here I am. You know what I mean? But my expectations are way lower now. And I wouldn't really recover my mental health. My mental health wouldn't really get much better until about a year after, in 2012. So that was my life in 2011. Um, yeah, I kind of sucked. Didn't really care for how was, things were going. Anyways, so God, John Cena in. The late 2000s and the early 2010s, up until I would say probably 2015, was straight up at his cringiest. Like, this is... Like, like, like... Cena segments and promos in 2011... I'm, I'm pretty sure... It, it, I'm pretty sure it can give someone cancer. Like, which is why he does all the stuff for the Make-A-Wish kids. He has to apologize for for cringe, for giving them cringe cancer. So he has to visit the same kids who he infected it with. You know what I mean? That's how bad his fucking segments were. Oh my god. Like, watching this show was pain. Okay? And, and okay. Okay. It's funny how they never mentioned that Michael Cole was like a Miz fanboy in 2011 and how he hated Daniel Bryan with a, with a passion, okay? Because, like, they... Because, oh my God, it was crazy. <laughs> and it had a chance because I do remember it, and I was like, oh man, it was pretty funny because now Michael Cole is actually, actually like... He's embracing the fact that he's just cringeworthy and horribly cringe and just the worst ever. You know what I mean? But Josh Matthews is supposed to be the lead announcer? Yeah, no. <sighs> no. Nothing nothing really against Josh Matthews. I guess he does pretty well on Impact now. But good Christ. Like on Raw, he's just no. <laughs> and it's also funny because in this show uh, Jerry the King's Lawler uh, Jerry the King Lawler his mom died and so they, they take a moment and Cole says uh, King's mom died 
And so that sucks and our prayers are with you. But then later on in the show, later on in the show, Cole, like, takes digs at him. Goes like, yo, like, you're going to die just like your mom did if you go if you get in the ring with Miz. And they were supposed to have a match, I guess, at, a, at Elimination Chamber, which they were pushing. So, yeah, it's just, oh, God. And yeah, and, and Del Rio, Alberto Del Rio, that would be a Dark Side of the Ring episode on that guy's ass. Oh my god. He was feuding with Edge for the World Heavyweight title. And yeah, so this was Edge's final feud before he retired, before he Funk retired, meaning he retired then came back a few years later, or over almost a decade later. <laughs> Similar to Terry Funk. Daniel Bryan, same thing. Shawn Michaels, same thing. Retirement doesn't mean shit. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't, but I don't blame Edge for wanting to come back. If you, if people say, oh, your last feud was, was with Alberto Del Rio, one of the worst people in wrestling to come down the pike since, I don't know, since, uh, let's see, who's a real asshole in wrestling? I wouldn't want to say New Jack because it's almost justified since he takes his work so well, since he does take things way too serious. But he also gives you clear instructions like, yo, do not do this or I'll stab the shit out of you. Let's see. Like, who's a real piece of shit in wrestling? Oh, uh, let's see. Warrior, but I met the guy. But yeah, in the realm of professional wrestling and sports entertainment, you know, the worst guy that come down the pike since the Ultimate Warrior, Alberto Del Rio. So Edge probably did want to come back because <laughs> he probably didn't want his final feud to be with Alberto Del Rio. And yeah, so I mentioned in No Way Out, in my No Way Out review or whatever, that chicks weren't really being treated too well. They were being treated like god awful here, okay? Like, they had like a big, it was a Natalia versus uh, Eve, Eve Torres? Eve Torres, who is the ladies' champion, the Divas' champion, in a Lumberjill match. So, you know, female Lumberjacks. The chicks 10 years ago, save for. We'll say Beth Phoenix and Natalia, and that's all I can think of. They left too much to be desired. Okay, like all of them were made of plastic. None of them looked real. None of them had any ability in the ring, and very few of them were attractive. Or Layla L. Also, Layla is pretty cool. Michelle McCool kind of. But those are only real four that I took seriously back then. Everyone else got awful. The fact that the Bella twins, like, stayed around as long as they did, like, no, man. No. Okay? Oh, my God. Oh, It's just, watching this, watching Raw in 2011, before the pipe bomb, even some of them after the pipe bomb, were just god awful. Shit. <laughs> but the, okay this was before Mark Henry in his Hall of Pain which that was another really good thing out of 2011 was Mark Henry's Hall of Pain that was goddamn amazing this is before the Hall of Pain this was when Mark Henry was just a blue chipper and he gets beaten up by Sheamus and they were pushing him to be like the next Brock Lesnar almost like you could tell and Seamus still had his, like, uh, he had his, uh, his, his Titan Tron theme was with, uh, lyrics. It was, a uh, I don't remember the name of the song, but it starts with, it starts out with, like, it's a shameful thing, lost your head, a careless man. <laughs> I don't know, I don't remember this, I don't remember the rest of the words, I'm not gonna recite them. <laughs> so I don't care. Cause that was and and like Seamus is like oh what look out for me in the elimination chamber and and no one gives a shit like 
The Miz had a match against Daniel Bryan, so this would be the first of like their, you know, sixty nine thousand matches that. It was, if people want to bitch about Orton versus Cena, Miz versus Bryan, like, is the same thing. Okay, so don't even talk. At least Orton versus Cena, you know they have good chemistry, and you know they put on good goddamn matches. Can I say the same thing about Miz versus Daniel Bryan? Somewhat, a little bit, but it's not the same. They had a decent match. It was okay. And Miz was the WWE Champion by him at this time. Which, no offense to him, but it's about two years too early. Okay, I want Miz. I, I look. Even when I first saw Miz, two thousand five, I was like, "This dude's gonna contribute a lot to the industry." But not in five years. In about ten years, when he's pushing forty, or when he's or when he's about to turn thirty-five. Miz was, I think, thirty-one here. In two thousand eleven, now he's forty-one. Okay. I think he's 40. I don't know. I think he's a year older than me. So he's 40 now. So he was 30 in 2011. He still... He always had good speaking skills. But his work was not... Dan Bryan carried his ass in that match. In a Raw 2011. He just didn't know... How to really tell a story with his body until the mid 2010s, until until his intercontinental title reigns, and he's a perfect workhorse and IC champion. Is the Miz, who I think should have won the WWE or World Heavyweight titles a couple more times, just in transitional reigns. He's a perfect transitional champion. Is the Miz. And, 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 and wrestling needs those types of individuals. Needs those kind of guys. Because these are the guys who you know can put on good matches who don't get hurt. And that's exactly what he said in his 2016 pipe bomb. Was that he said, look, who, how many times have I gotten injured in my whole 10 year career? Never. You know what I mean? So, yeah. But did he deserve to have the WWE title here? No. CM Punk deserved to have it here. And everyone knew that, too. Speaking of CM Punk, so he had a match against John Cena, and none of the Nexus guys help him because whatever. But after the match, uh, the Nexus guys come out and attack Cena, and so, like, a whole bunch of other w- a whole bunch of other guys attack the Nexus and stuff. So they're still trying to do the Nexus stuff, but not really. I mean, after... Uh, after Cena just, you know, ate them in the fall of 2010, like, no one gave a shit. Also, no one really established was on Nexus. You know, I mean, yeah, like, okay, let's all shit on Cena versus Orton, but that could have added another really significant chapter to the Cena versus Orton mega feud. You know what I mean? To have Orton lead the Nexus? Yeah. No, that's why I did a fancy booking thing on the Nexus, because it's true. Anyways, yeah, I'm looking at my notes right now, and uh, here we go. I'm about to get a headache from this. I got two words that, that, that sums up the first quarter of 2011 in WWE. The Chaperone. Don't watch that movie, everybody. Don't watch it. I did. It's one of the. It's it's. If Geely, that stars Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez, I think, is the worst movie ever, The Chaperone has it, almost has a beat, probably does have a beat, and so the little girl who stars in it, who is like Triple H's daughter, in the movie makes an appearance, and she's like, "It's time to do the kiss cam," and I'm like. His cam. That's 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 a great Kali thing. And I was like, oh shit. Kali comes out and I'm like, oh, I didn't know he was still in WWE. Damn. That's crazy. 
And then finally, the last, like, 20 or so minutes of the show is the reveal of the host of WrestleMania 27, which, to be really honest, it's got to be one of the most forgettable paper, one of the most forgettable WrestleManias of all time. Like, like, like the only thing I remember about it is Cena versus Miz. And that's where Rock comes in and he helps uh, Miz retain. So Rock comes out, crowd goes absolutely ballistic insane. Because, no shit, because it's The Rock. You know what I mean? So, says he's going to host WrestleMania. Says he left seven years ago and he's never going to go away. That kind of stuff. And yeah, all that other nonsense. And to be really honest, it's this moment right here that where Rock comes back as WrestleMania 27's host. This starts the part, what I call the part-timer era. Because this is where WWE finally understood that, that they don't need to push younger guys anymore. That they can do exactly what WCW did from 1995 to 1997 in a continuous loop. And just sell nostalgia to the fans. And you're seeing it now. You're seeing it with a 57-year-old Goldberg against a 33-year-old Drew McIntyre. You know what I mean? You're seeing it with other shit like that. You know what I mean? You're, you saw it all. You saw it everywhere in 2018, 2019. You're gonna see it more and more and more. And this very moment where The Rock was revealed as WrestleMania 27's host and the twice in a lifetime program with uh, Cena versus Rock. Yeah, like this started it, folks. Like this started the entire part-time era that people were bitching about. And the reason why, and I'm gonna end on this. Here's the reason why WWE can just spit out part-timers in hot shot. It's because they don't care about viewers. They don't care about ratings. They don't care about any of that. D and Solo Monster has talked about this, and I'm pretty sure uh, Brian Alvarez and Dave Meltzer and other guys, JD from NY, GMW, other way more established wrestling uh, podcasters and content creators, uh, far with far greater audiences than me, can vouch for this as well. Is that WWE Raw has done its worst ratings now, or? last six or so months, whatever, in all 2020, and currently 2021. Worst ratings ever, yet they made the most money ever. Hmm. Wonder why. Maybe it's because they don't need fans anymore, and they don't need viewers. Maybe because they figured that out. Okay? So, when people get all upset about these part-timers, you have to say to yourself, if you are under 35 years old, under 45 years old, under 55 years old even, and you're looking at WWE who's going to say, yes, you're going to, you're going to job to a dude who you watched in your childhood. Your heroes are your heroes until you meet them, right? And yes, I know that Drew McIntyre, he retained the WWE title against Goldberg, but the fact of the matter is is that a 57-year-old dude was in a match with someone 20 years younger than him. Now, this is not new, okay? I mentioned Terry Funk, right? How old was he when he won that ECW title at Barely Legal 97? He was 53. How old was Raven? 33. So it's been happening. So when everyone gets all surprised about all these part-timers coming back, it's like, no, bro. Like, it's done been happening for a very long time. And it's been happening on a consistent basis since that moment. Since The Rock came back as WrestleMania 27's host. Anyways. I hope you enjoyed this. A little trip down memory lane. 
the last installment of Joseph Remembers that you'll see on this channel, but I will do other stuff, but on a different channel because I realize now that uh, making one little, making one channel with a whole bunch of content doesn't really grow my audience. I need one, I need different channels for different audiences, you know? <laughs> so I'm gonna start doing that in March. So be prepared for that. Um, yeah, that's all. Uh, in the meantime, I'm gonna be doing lots of gaming stuff. I'm gonna be playing Final Fantasy IX here in a bit. Uh, about, I'm about to go live on that, actually, in about a half hour. Uh, let me, let me get some food and then I'm gonna do that. Um, so yeah. Uh, more Final Fantasy IX stuff. Uh, I'm gonna probably do a speedrun of it sometime within the next week. I'll schedule it a few days in advance um, just to let you know what is going on and when I'm gonna do that. Uh, I want to do a complete Final Fantasy IX speedrun. I've been meaning to do it. It's like, it's I'm like obsessed with it now. It's really bad. So yeah, um, I hope you enjoyed this. Take care of yourselves. And thank you for listening. And I'll see you in the next stream or I'll see you in the next video. Take care.